man. We can get started now. So what I wanted to do, first of all, is like, um, I think people should know kind of your background because you are, I mean, you're not a newcomer to this space. You're from Vuforia, Qualcomm. Can you just kind of talk about like what your background, what you bring from your background with regard to the AR and VR space, like based on your previous experience, like, you know, just so people sure. know, like kind of like, you know, how robust your experience is in this space. Yeah. I mean, I, um, I've been doing it a little while. I've, I've been in this AR VR space about 13 years. Um, and it really started at Qualcomm where, uh, you know, I, I started the Vuforia group um, you know, from an early R and D project, so just a few folks in in Qualcomm Research, and we grew that both uh, organically and through a series of acquisitions to be a pretty widespread and widely used developer platform. Uh, so the product grew; it became a separate business unit at Qualcomm, and then in uh, 2015, um, we we sold the Vuforia business and division to uh, PTC. And so I went with the group and uh, ran AR at um, at PTC as president of Euphoria. So you know, needless to say, I've I've got a lot of experience um, with the technology stacks and know which kind of pieces do what because we spend a lot of time deep in the tech at Qualcomm. But I think the other thing that was really valuable about the experience was understanding the breadth of different use cases and and what the barriers to adoption really are because you know i i like to consider myself a a student of of jeffrey moore and technology adoption and and for me you know building products and building businesses is all about knocking down those barriers yeah and you know i i was a bad host i forgot to just name check so jay wright you are jay wright the ceo of campfire um campfire is like, I feel like we're allowed to say kind of like what the previous iteration was. Um, yeah. Are you okay with that? Talking about that? Yeah. I mean, I think it's important to know that this is, this is not a new iteration. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Frame it for I, us. Uh, I came upon an opportunity. I was actually reached, somebody reached out to me and said, Hey, uh, you ought to talk to, uh, you ought to talk to these VCs who, who bought the assets of the former medic company. And, um, you know, I'd had some experience with the Meta company in the past. I thought the display system on the Meta 2 was fabulous, like just fabulous. The, um, you know, there's some issues kind of with the rest of the product experience, but I, I really like that. And and so I went and took a look at what those assets were, and, and there was some interesting stuff there. There was, um, there was a patent portfolio. It was pretty meaningful. And, you know, coming from Qualcomm, I appreciate the value of a patent portfolio, especially if you want to build something big. Um, there was, uh, there was a display system that was sort of a next generation beyond the Meta 2 that was ready to go, but hadn't been commercialized. And there was also the, the Meta brand, um, you know, which I thought probably had positive net equity, um, ended up kind of changing our minds on that one. But anyway, I, I, I saw those as pretty important assets or building blocks. And so, uh, as we joined and we used that tech, but I'd, I'd say the, the assets that, that we purchased um, that were originally developed by Meta Company are, are one of a few magical things that we mix together to realize the experience and product that that uh, we've launched with Campfire. And so just, um, I, I, this is really kind of like a silly question, but I have to ask as like someone who is yeah. very familiar with like the old, you know, uh, product that bears that name. Where'd you, like, what, what, led you guys to come up with that name? What's the, I, I think I have a sense of it, but I mean, are you, you know, worried about any confusion with the old software that we know, like the business chat software and what led you to kind of like move from, uh, my memory is MetaView when I first heard of your involvement. With, yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So the, um, so these, the VCs that, that started the company and bought the assets named the new company MetaView, you know, and I think they thought the meta name was an asset and, you know, frankly, I thought the meta name was an, was an asset too, and something that we can move forward with. Um, and then, um, you know, a few things happen. I think when when things kind of go down, you know, the the way the way that meta that meta did, just, you know, despite everybody's best intentions, you you leave you leave some wreckage. And and so I saw you know a lot of the effects kind of of, 
of that that wreckage with some partners and customers and investors and, and stuff. And so, you know, it became clear that hey, we uh, we ought to we ought to change change the name, not move forward with the Meta brand, um, but do something fundamentally new. And I think it also became clear too that you know the the whole sort of product and team and everything was so different that uh, we just wanted to start off on a on a new footing. So I I think the actual name Campfire is really important um, because the whole the whole way Campfire works is sort of people kind of huddled together, right, to have this natural communication. And and if you think back, I think well we can't think back this far because it predates all of us. But, you know, picture a bunch of cave people around a, a campfire. That was like the original high bandwidth, super low latency communication. And and I think, uh, you know, that model today reflects itself around people's dinner tables and living rooms and certainly conference rooms at, at work, right? You go into a meeting room, everyone's around a table. And I think the whole campfire sort of name kind of harkens that experience and that collaboration model. I, th- I also think the name's pretty pretty memorable, so I like it. Cool, cool. And I think maybe I'm just kind of like a little old school. I think a lot of people probably don't, you know, there won't be that much confusion with uh, the campfire name. I I do want to kind of just drill into campfire. But before we move past, like kind of the past, I just want to kind of just I I looked at kind of the the new site, the team. And I noticed that you brought in like a couple of um, team members from the old crew, the old meta crew. And I like that. I have to say, because I'm not sure, you know, as a reporter, you know, part of what we do is like we look for the story, you know, you know yeah. j- as preferably dispassionately. I mean, passionately in terms of finding the information, but yeah. preferably not um, with any particular bias, you know, for any particular outcome. But I can say like, you know, since, you know, this is just a casual chat. I can say f- look, from my from my standpoint, you know, I I've, I've visited the meta offices in Silicon Valley. I met the founder and the team. And I was really rooting for the You know, the original team. And I was like really happy with what they were doing. I was really impressed. And so yeah. kind of like when the turn happened, you know, I wasn't very happy about it. But, you know, we had to report on it. But seeing that you brought over like some of the old team members, that that makes me feel good. I'm just wondering, like, um, like how much? Like, like is it just a couple of people? Like, I I, know, I see like software, hardware. It seems like there's an operations person there. Like, how much of the old team is involved? And and we, uh, when you when, we when you speak to them as CEO, as like kind of like the yeah. new leader of this effort, like, what do you talk to them about? Like, how we're going to do things differently. We ha- we have just one one employee from the previous Meta, um, and and uh, is Steve Warden is his name, and Steve is um, he is just an amazing combination of industrial design, mechanical design, um, just just unbelievable. I think he probably has more products, hardware products to his credit, than a lot of agencies and Silicon Valley, like product design agencies. So he's done everything from, you know, stuff, devices for Apple to Polycom, Cisco, um, amazing. And, and so Steve had familiarity with, uh, with the piece of, of meta IP that, that we were using, right? So he's really a key, key asset and, and moving forward. And, you know, I'd say generally, um, you know, Steve, when it, when it came to the plan and what we're going to do with Campfire, when I came in, he, uh, you know, he had some questions and stuff because it was a very different sort of strategy than throwing out a device in an SDK. But you know, the the more things inched forward with further prototypes and and as he saw the experience evolve, um, you know, his conviction and excitement around it just went crazy. And uh, and so, yeah, he's he's a tremendous tremendous asset to uh, to the team. And he's been huge in in realizing what we've done so far. Cool. And I mean, um, well, a couple of people on your team list seem to have Meta in their um, LinkedIn profile. So maybe that's a mistake or there's some, I don't know, maybe there's something not kind of translating. But either way, like the second part of the question, like what? Yeah. W- like when you speak to Steve and just in general, like what is it that you plan to in general like approach differently, like what the, we're not going to focus on kind of like, you know, focusing on, you know, what happened in terms of mistakes or what could have been done better in the past. 
that's not really productive. But what what is it that you think you'll be able to like turn? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's almost like saying what we're doing different than any other company, right? It's a completely it's a completely different company. I think the biggest challenge with all this AR stuff and where people kind of get wrapped around the axle is is just sort of focusing on a particular use case. And I can tell you, even in building Vuforia and doing things that you know, Qualcomm scale, man, it's so easy. It's so easy to get diverted, right? Because you've got all these people that have all these exciting ideas and you know, got somebody that's calling you from an auto manufacturer that wants to do something amazing. You got people from Hollywood that are showing up and want to do something amazing. And you can you can get this shiny object syndrome real quick, right? Right. right. And and you get, you know, you get executives or investors that get all spun up about something and and man, it's just really, really hard. So when people say, hey, what's like the hardest thing about, you know, building any sort of product in this AR space? And I tell them it's it's focus. It's it's sticking to a particular use case. And that's so important, right? That's so important, especially with the stuff that goes on your head, because there's so many trade-offs involved. And, you know, if you're trying to do the general purpose thing for everybody right now, you know, as you know, forget about it. But as soon as you start focusing and you get these constraints, man, constraints are beautiful, beautiful, beautiful things. Yeah. You know, when yeah. when you constrain problems, you start getting really simple and elegant solutions and ones that work better and have better performance than you ever would have expected. And that is exactly what happened with Campfire. Yeah. You know, I, I would liken it to um, deadlines. You know, when if you don't have a deadline to finish a piece of work and it's open ended, you know, you'll kind of like scribble and freestyle forever. But if you have a deadline where, you know, like this is the drop dead date, you'll just turn in, you know, you know, you have to turn in something and, and then you you kind of it, it really helps focus the mind. And I, I do find that like um, there's a I'm not going to name the company, but a, a certain company in Florida, it seemed like that company had a bit of a problem with focus. And it's good to see that company now very much laser focused on one particular area. Yeah. Um, so yeah. on, you know, on that note, wh what is your focus? Like, wh where are you guys going? Like, what is the primary mission? Look, we're, we're focused on collaboration for enterprise and specifically extending existing 3D workflows, right? So people that are working with 3D today on their flat screens, those, those are the folks that we're focused on enabling, so we want to give them the ability to share and collaborate what they're working on with others locally and remotely. And a lot of that has to do with people who are involved in design and engineering and building products. Because, uh, you know, after spending a few years running the AR division of a CAD company, um, you really come to appreciate how big that need is. And, uh, you know, as I dug deeper and started, uh, you know, getting close to this, and even when we were trying to solve this with, with Euphoria, you know, you, you realize this has been a kind of a holy grail capability of sorts for a long time. So we're going to we're going to stick in that spot of how do we take this desktop desktop 3D and expand that and make it really shareable um, for people that are building products and then selling them and and uh, so on. OK, so as an old school Apple head, you know, like Apple devotee, I was really yeah. excited to see Frog involved, uh, at least yeah. as a test company, you know, for the yeah. system. Now, did they have any hand in the design of the headset or no? Of the system itself, not just the headset? Yeah, so we got Frog involved really early. Um, there's probably half a dozen companies that I wanted to get close to early. Um, and because we're going to focus on design, right, I wanted to come out of the gate with some of the world's best designers. Um, so we engaged with Frog. And when we came to Frog, we had a prototype of the headset. Um, I'll probably... I'll probably share some of those pictures of what those prototypes look like. That would um, be great. Yeah, we had um, we had prototype for the console, and and then for the pack, we really it was kind of a a sensor um, like hooked to the back of a phone, right? It's pretty raw. You can start these things pretty raw, and uh, and so we said, hey, um, frog, make this uh, make this sensor into something that can just attach to the phone, right? And and they did that sort of soup to nuts. And, and then they, they made some industrial design um, refinements and enhancements to both the, the console and the headset to make it all hang together, right, with the same kind of brand aesthetic that we wanted to be very approachable 
um, very sort of familiar yet futuristic and and utilitarian. And and I'll tell you, I am just thrilled with uh, with the work they did. Just just thrilled. Yeah, I thought I sensed like aesthetically some frog DNA there. So I think, so that yeah. makes sense. So Avi said something the other day on Twitter that made me, they, I, I wanted to ask you about. So yeah. is this system like, you know, a soup to nuts system that you will be selling branded as Campfire to companies? Or is this kind of like uh, not quite white label turnkey solution that other companies will be able to brand for themselves and deploy as their own product? We're starting with the former. I really want to change the game for how easy it is to set this stuff up and go, right? And and the goal here, and I think what we've achieved, at least from what we've seen and heard so far, is this is no harder to install and use than plugging in a monitor and downloading an app on your phone and PC and you go. And, uh, you know, just so like maybe uh, you think of a Peloton or an early drop cam, you know, you're, you're signing up and you buy and use the, the hardware and the service that goes with it and it's turnkey and it it just works. No, this might be difficult to describe on your end uh, via audio, but can you explain the VR component? Because from the demo video, I was able to kind of suss out, okay, what's going on with the AR, but what, yeah. what exactly is happening on the VR side? You, you, you guys use the VR term in, uh, in your package. So I'm just curious, like what's, what's happening there? Yeah. Well, you might, um, as far as visuals go, if you go to the, uh, if you go to the campfire website, campfire3d.com, and you scroll down, you'll see kind of an animation. It shows the campfire experience. And you can switch a little selector on there between AR and VR. And so both those AR and VR views are possible with the campfire headset. They're done with the campfire headset. So what you have is you, you wear the campfire headset, you have a visor on there that's transparent, and uh, that, that pops off magnetically, and you replace it with another that's opaque. Ah. Okay. And you've just gone from, I think, the highest fidelity AR that you can put on your head to the most comfortable VR. Like nothing actually touches your face. Um, there's a trade off with what we're doing um, with VR, which is it's not fully immersive. But look, this, this is not about training use cases where we need pilots to feel like, you know, the plane's going down. These are people that are visualizing products. And, uh, and this approach actually works extremely, extremely well. I think the other thing that's probably worth mentioning is, you know, our customer doesn't really care about AR, VR as technologies or, or terms. They care about the fact that they can visualize against the real world or any background of their choice. And, and it just so happens that, you know, we call those things AR and, and VR. Uh, but you got to do both, right? They, you have to be able to do both for this, this class of, of app. And, and I think you know, the fact that we could do them so well on a single device, it's a pretty big deal. Okay. And so now you guys are focusing on enterprise, which has, I mean, I think most of the people creating, not most, but some of the big players in, in AR who are working on, you know, some of the problems involved, uh, understand how difficult it is to deploy kind of like a consumer lightweight pair of smart glasses that, you know, are fashionable that everyone will wear and that really deliver like a, a full experience. So, yeah. So I'm finding that a lot of these companies are like, you know, leaning into the more kind of robust enterprise, kind of like large headset. And I'm just wondering, so you have a lot of, com you know, competition. So I'm just wondering, like, what is it that you, well, first of all, how much is it? How much is is the system? And what is, uh like, what are you guys bringing to the table that you feel you're kind of outdoing the competition on? So, so let's, let's just talk about the difference and what's going on in enterprise, right? Because I think... A, a, a large percentage of what's happening in enterprise is happening with with Euphoria, at least from a developer perspective, and and so I have pretty pretty good visibility on that, or at least I did till pretty recently. So what's happening in in enterprise AR is largely about the frontline worker. Um, in in some way, most of these applications are how do we how do we help this guy moving around a factory floor, moving around some kind of industrial environment? How do we help him perform some kind of task? And, and sometimes that's what we call like these remote expert or these remote assist solutions where you got somebody looking through their camera and walking them through it. Uh, sometimes it's just as simple as putting PDFs in the corner of their eye to follow instructions, but generally that's what it's about. And, and it turns out that um, deploying solutions to these frontline workers, you know, these are people that, that haven't necessarily been automated before or had a device before. And, and it's a pretty heavy lift to get these things going, right? You, you got to spend pretty significant money 
to just create the content, set up the systems to make these work. You got to train the folks. Then you've got all these concerns about sort of privacy and safety and and it's a lot, right? And then by the time IT gets involved, it's like, wow, you know, this pilot was great, but this deployment isn't necessarily a, a no-brainer. So we're not about the frontline worker, right? This is not a frontline worker. This is the knowledge worker. This is somebody that is largely in their in their office, whether it's a, you know, at the work facility or at home or in a conference room or meeting room. They're not walking down the streets. They're not even really, really mobile. And and this use case for the office worker has been talked about for a long time. I mean, you'll see it in marketing materials for AR folks. I mean, everyone's been showing it, but but um, you know, you, you can't actually realize it in current devices. I, I don't know if you've tried with existing devices to try and set up or make any of these multi-user things work, but you know, in, in my experience, they they all fall down in three major areas. One of them is just the overall visual experience, right? If I if I can't get a big enough AR field of view, it's kind of a non-starter. And and this use case has really been a non-starter, at least for visualization for for knowledge workers. And and I think the second big challenge has been like God setting this stuff up and learning how to use it. Like there's a bunch of friction here. And again, I, I don't know how many systems you've tried to set up, but as soon as you start mixing together AR and VR and a lot of people in the same room and then other locations, man, like you're sticking things to the walls, you're, you're scanning the rooms and trying to share them, and um, it's really tough. And, and then you also have this notion of, I got I to gotta show people how to learn like new controllers, or I got I to gotta teach them what, what I, I jokingly refer to as AR sign language <laughs> um, gestures. And it's not a no-brainer, right? I mean, for this kind of stuff to take off, I need to have an executive walk in the room and go, yeah, Joe, put this on, check it out. You know, and, and I can't be like going to get a prescription for their glasses or say, okay, here's how you use it, all these controllers and so on. And then finally, like the other big challenge has been once you get all the stuff stitched together and you're looking at it, you know, you get in there and and you kind of wave at each other's avatars and you go, yeah, this is cool. But, but then it's kind of like, now what? Like we're on this island and, and all of our data is still on the mainland. Everybody else is still on Zoom and Teams in the mainland. You know, our 2D screens in the mainland. And so the, the workflow integration has really been a challenge. So, you know, in, in my mind, you know, we've had some technology. We have some products out there that we could stitch together and try to make this work. But visual experience hasn't, hasn't been there. That's been a showstopper all by itself. I think ease of use hasn't been there. That's been a showstopper all by itself. And, and this workflow integration hasn't been there and, and has been a showstopper. And, and so I, I think you experience all three of those things with almost everything on the market today. And, and we said, hey, we're going to take a step back and we're going to get rid of all these barriers in one fell swoop with a new set of devices and applications. And, and that's what we did with Campfire. Yeah, you know, um, I want to just... I have some more questions about the system itself, but just lightning round real quick. Uh, field of view, 92 degrees diagonal? Correct. Um, tethered, untethered. It seems tethered. Tethered with a cable. Okay. And what is that cable leading to exactly? A PC with a discrete GPU. We have not named a min spec. Um, we will. Okay. But you're, you're going to want some processing power, right? This is about industrial strength workflows and industrial strength data so we we want to plug into a to a gpu that's that's running off ac power not not batteries gotcha okay well that that answers the other question i had so talk to me a bit about this like the three-part system um i want to talk about the console like that's very yeah. interesting like can you just kind of describe again via audio it may be difficult but just describe what this console is one of the big challenges i mentioned earlier is how do you how do you get these experiences set up um, so that you can really have an, an instantaneous experience? And and we want to have something that's as instantaneously and reliable as the monitor on your desk, right? Like when I turn on the monitor on my desk, it works whether I'm looking at it alone. It works if five people are looking at it, and you know it works in solid white rooms. It's just reliable. And, and if you're going to try and do shared experiences in AR and VR, it's not that way. And so the way we've made this an intuitive and instant on experience like a monitor is to actually to come up with a device that acts like one. And, and so the console gives you 
this intuitive device that represents a monitor and it always tells you kind of where to look. Um, and, and you probably, you probably done these VR collaboration experiences before, but I like to joke, you know, sometimes you put on that headset and it's like, okay, uh, where am I? <laughs> uh, okay. But where, where are you? Uh, right, what, right. Now, what, are we, what are we looking at? And, and like that all goes away with, with the console, right? You know exactly where to look. You know where the experience is going to start, and you know where to expect people around it. And that just makes it so intuitive. Now, the other thing that it does is it, it houses a new type of tracking system. And, and that tracking system happens to work in a really wide range of environments, right? As, as, as someone that spent more than a decade building tracking tech, um, I can tell you that you know just using computer vision approaches is awesome and it's awesome tech and, and we can do shared experiences and we can create anchors and cloud anchors and we can share them. And that's all wonderful. It's all wonderful till we all get in a white room with a white table um, and other office environments that, that are pretty common. So, so we found that, that the console, not only did we make it ridiculously intuitive for where to look with this you know, notion of it being like a 3D monitor, um, but we found it a really, really powerful to deliver that just instant on for uh, multi-user experiences in multiple locations. And for those who haven't, uh, for those listening who haven't seen the console, you can go to uh, campfire3d.com and, and take a look. It's basically two uh, strips, two very slim strips that are connected together uh, in an X, I guess, con configuration. And it looks yep. tethered. That's tethered to the PC? That um, That's tethered to power. It just plugs in the wall. Okay. You know, when too many companies approach these various problems the same way, you start to wonder, okay, well, okay, maybe now we're just playing the, uh, the incremental specs game. But when yeah. a company like really tries to tackle a problem from a completely different angle, it's exciting. So I, I kind of, I feel like that's what's happening here. So let's talk about the right. pack. Like what's the battery life on that? How's that work with your smartphone? You know, just kind of walk us through that really quickly. I think the battery life on that I don't know. I, I think in the units we have on the Pioneer program, it's like ten hours. Um, so it's an all it's an all day it's an all day thing. It uh, it snaps onto the back of the phone. Just kind of it's got these spring loaded arms that that snap on. There's no Wi-Fi setup. There's no Bluetooth setup. It actually it's actually communicating um, directly with the headset wirelessly. And and so what it what it does do is it it'll use NFC to wake up the app on the phone and just launch it launch the app for the controller. So it's totally, it's totally seamless. You know, it's almost like, uh, I, don't know, I wish we would have known about the, um, what's the cool name of the stuff that's on the back of the iPhone I'm talking on right now with the magnet. Um, uh, I'm sure someone, <laughs> someone in the audience <laughs> is, is yelling it into their thing. phone right now. By the way, yeah. uh, time permitting, we'll, we'll, we'll allow for a couple of questions if Jay has time. Um, yeah. I just want to get a couple uh, extra uh, questions uh, yeah. from my side. Um, and that, that, so that spring-loaded, kind of attachment that that's just is that kind of like whatever a uh, brand agnostic it can attach to like how does that work because there are so many different kinds of uh sizes and you know form factors now with smartphones like is there a specific phone this is designed for yeah and and this is you know this is where you want to be working with people like frog um i think we went from like iphone mini naked like no case um all the way to pro max with with the biggest case we could find, which I don't recall what it is. Um, and, and that was, I'm not trying to stick there just to, to, uh, iPhone. I mean, the idea here is, is we want to support any recent phone that people have iPhone or, or Android, but the folks, that, you know, folks that have the, uh, the folding phones and, and things like that probably be a challenge, but I think those are still in relatively small numbers. Yeah. Yeah. The folding phone still hasn't, they, they keep trying to make it a thing, but it yeah. <laughs> seems to be stuck yeah. in the launch pad for some reason. Yeah. Um, so what, um, is there like a software suite? Like, do you have like a primary app? Yeah, there's, there's two apps that make this whole thing go. Um, and the first one is, uh, is really the bridge between the island and the mainland that I was talking earlier. Like, how do you get your, your content in here? And, and we call it campfire scenes. And, and I generally explain campfire scenes as uh, like a combination of Google Docs and PowerPoint for 3D. So it's like Google Docs in that these documents live in the cloud. You share them with a link, and they're inherently collaborative. 
right? So if multiple people have the link and they open it together, they're just in the space together, boom, in there. They can open it alone, you know, whenever they want. Um, it's like a PowerPoint in that it's organized not as a series of two-dimensional slides, but of three-dimensional scenes. So, you know, you say new scene, and once you've got a scene, instead of, you know, like in PowerPoint, you might compose a slide of a bunch of text and graphics and PNGs. You know, in campfire scenes, you compose with 3D files you already have. Um, so there's like more than 40 formats of CAD and 3D formats you can just, you know, drop in and um, and share and collaborate with. I want to circle back to the price question. I don't think you answered that. Yeah. <laughs> no, I didn't. Um, we haven't announced it. What, what are we looking at? Are we looking at the price of a laptop realm? Are we looking at the price of like a... You know, like a, a you know a three D system. You know, so, you know, like what is the at, here's, at least here's the ballpark? We want, we want, we want Campfire to be available and compelling for organizations of all sizes, and and we want a value proposition that is a no brainer when comparing to how you would solve this in other ways. So if you're going to look at you know Hololens and high end VR headset and and then you're going to buy software on top of that, and then training, or maybe software development. We're we're going to have one single one single price. Well, probably, I mean, multiple prices and plans, but one one single stop, one stop shopping that you can go to, get everything together, and know that when users pull that thing out of the box, they can plug it in, it'll work, and and just go. So and that's about that's about as far as as I'm prepared to go on on pricing today, but. And, and you know, we'll we'll reveal that as we get we get closer. Yeah, that's that's fine. And do you have like a general window, like Q three, Q four, for when you're gonna kind of announce like more of the details on that, and when you'll actually like open this up for like uh, you know we, purchase? We we want to ship. We're we're targeting to ship commercially in the in the fall. Gotcha. I think the the we're running this um, pioneer program, essentially this early access program now. And so to, to some extent, you know, the date's going to depend on feedback that we get. But we're pretty comfortable about that. Um, we actually started the Pioneer program in January with a small number of folks. So, you know, we got to the point where we got the big kinks out and it was ready to go broader. And, and that's why we uh, announced it on Tuesday. And, and folks that want to jump in can actually apply for that program on the Campfire website now. Awesome. And a bit of a philosophical question. So, yeah. you know, we all went through the pandemic this past year, moving into 2021, um, yeah. we all, not all, many of us thought we knew what would happen, what um, workflows would work, which wouldn't. Um, and we kind of got forced by reality to just kind of figure out, you know, how to deal with all this with the tools at our hands. And yeah. I, when I'm, I'm looking at Campfire and I feel like, and this is, this is, I'm, I'm moving to a question. I, I feel like it seems like what you guys are doing was somewhat informed by watching the events of the last, I don't know, what is it, 16 months, 12, you know, 13, 14, 15 months um, with regard to keep it simple, stupid, you know, just really paring down the use case scenario and really nailing down and focusing on, you know, what it is you guys are trying to accomplish and how you would make something easy for someone who is, you know, collaborating remotely. Uh, do I have that right? Is, is that, did this last year inform, you know, kind of some of your decisions? And, and, and beyond that, what do you think of these other companies in the AR space and to, to a lesser degree VR, but primarily AR? where it seems like they're trying to do everything. It seems like they're trying to pack as much as they can into their devices and into their software platforms to the point where it's like, it's so expensive and it's so, you know, there's so many bells and whistles that, you know, yeah, like we said before, it's almost, you, you struggle to figure out, okay, well, I can do everything, but where do I start? You know, there's no kind of like start point. It's just, it's so unfocused because yeah. you have so many options, which is, by the yeah. way, this the, just... Sorry, I do want you to answer, but this is why I love Frog, because Frog worked with Apple, and Apple's philosophy historically seems to be this notion of limiting, like kind of like we can do a, b a bunch of things, but we're going to purposely limit you to focus your use <laughs> and to focus, yeah. you know, the, the, the general, you know, you know the, yeah. the various scenarios. So a lot of questions there. Um, so I first one, COVID, um, what, what impact, what impact did it have? Look, when, when I started this, Right, I, I've known this was sort of. A, I'll just describe it as a killer capability for 
AR and VR for a long time. You know, it was something that we wanted to do in software for a long time. And the only reason we're doing hardware now is because I couldn't do it with software only in the past. And and I, you know, I, I think even without COVID, it was a it was a killer capability. When COVID happened, um, it clearly increased interest in this sort of thing. And and that was a big silver lining. It also changed our development priorities. Um, actually, the first prototypes that we were showing around um, were mostly focused on on the conference room use case. We have a lot of people in there together. And there were some other different technology requirements that we had for that use case that, you know, I think it was, uh, was it March 18th? I don't know, whenever we had to abandon ship in the Bay Area. Um, I think it was two weeks later, just under two weeks, and, uh, you know, kind of did a, a rethink. And once everybody got remote, we said, you know what, that that conference room case where everyone's together, yeah, that's that's not the most important anymore. And uh, and we shifted to to doing some different things, just really in a different order for everybody to be to be remote. So that was a big one. And I, you know, I think the other thing that we got out of it, and I think a lot of people got out of it, was um, you know, just it was really easy to be heads down, right? Productivity went up for a lot of people because when you're in quarantine, there's not as many other things to do. So so that was that was great. So that did, in fact, help focus kind of like the direction you guys took with Campfire. Or? I mean, look, we we changed we changed priorities. So we focused. We we did more things for every the everybody being remote use case than we would have for everybody being in the conference room together. Um, and and uh, and we'll still do those things. And you can still use it in a conference room now. It's just there were some different things that that we were able to deprioritize. In general, what do you think? Just to kind of circle back on the second part of the question, what do you think yeah. about these other AR companies that are kind of pack, you know trying to pack so many different features into uh, their hardware and software systems? Like, I'll just come back to focus. Like, you got to focus because there's there's too many hard trade offs here, um, and and if you don't focus, you know you you risk building a really expensive spork. <laughs> and, and, you know, I mean, some people are into that because you could do things with, there's a few people that, you know, have a use case for something that's a really expensive sport, but, um, you gotta, you gotta focus. And so I, I really like what I've seen from some other folks. Like I think Mira has taken a great approach. Um, I love what tilt five is, is doing, but they're focusing on specific use cases with hardware and software that, that works together. And you know they're coming up with a great experience that, that's going to have a good value proposition, and and I think I think that's the path. I think you know when it comes to big companies that are that are making the billion dollar the billion dollar plays, right? They got to take they got to take bigger swings, right? That they're on a they're on a bigger mission. They're how do we how do we replace the phone? What comes after the phone? How do we replace the PC? What comes after the PC? And and so you know they'll probably keep doing some some general purpose stuff, and that's great. Um, you know, it turns out all those efforts are kicking out really great core technologies that we're making tremendous use of, you know, for, for example, AR kit that we have in our iPad viewer, which is fabulous, love iPad and, and what's happening there. And even stuff like, um, you know, Microsoft mesh that comes out, there's really exciting stuff there that, you know, we can't, we can't wait to get under the hood in, uh, in campfire. Like, just give me kind of like your, just aside from Campfire, give me kind of like your forecast of the space in general, just the AR. Like, do you guys have a cloud solution? Do you think that's important to the space? Yeah, I mean, all of all of Campfire is, is based in the cloud. Look, I'm really, I'm really bullish on, on the space overall, right? I've, <laughs> I've been in it for, uh, for 13 years. You know, I, I built, I think, arguably one of the more successful things in, in the space with, with Euphoria and and I've seen a lot of things that have kind of hit, hit and missed, and I'm, and I'm still at it, you know. And not only am I still at it, but we came and decided to tackle hardware at a time when, you know, it's pretty hard to get excited about doing hardware, and um, you know, difficult, difficult to convince people that's a good idea. Right. Um, so I'm a big believer. I'm a big believer. I mean, I think as I as I mentioned before, I, I think the path forward to viable products in the near term is all about focus. And and if you if you really if you really focus on the use case and you welcome and embrace those constraints, and you solve for it, look, we have we've got some amazing building blocks out there available to us now. Amazing, and and campfire is is yet one recipe, 
I think they can be they can be mixed up, and and I'm I'm confident there's there's many more. So you know, I'm I'm optimistic that there's going to be other successes that happen, and of course, I'm I'm super excited about about the day that, you know, we've got consumer telepresence with something that looks like Ray-Bans. But, um, you know, until then, we're going to do what we're doing with uh, with Campfire. Cool. Okay, so I brought up one. We have uh, Scoble, Robert Scoble, the Scobalizer. You have a question yeah. or a comment? Yeah, I, I just wanted to know what, what Jay thinks is going to, what's, what's going to be the um, breakdown of uh, Enterprise. You got HoloLens, you got Magic Leap, you got you guys campfire there's other devices you know both on vr side and on ar side how how do you think the top five are gonna break out i think i think that the top level segmentation we should be thinking about is frontline worker versus knowledge worker and and frontline worker you know as i was talking about earlier is people that are kind of mobile walking around an industrial environment or factory or what have you and, and need some sense of instructions. And I think, you know, that's the bulk of where HoloLens is. I think that's the bulk of where, where magically seems to sort of be going. And frankly, that's, that's the bulk of most of what we've seen with headsets. Um, what, what we're trying to do and I think are doing with campfires, let's unlock the knowledge worker and, and the knowledge worker use case, I think has been talked about, with the virtual monitor use case, like, hey, let's just extend the screen. And and we're saying, hey, we're not ready for that. What we're doing is we're taking 3D you have on the desktop for people that work with 3D, and we're making that easy to share. So, you know, top level, I'd say, hey, frontline worker, and in frontline worker, you've got Realware, you've got Magic Leap, and you've got Microsoft and HoloLens. And then I think it comes to, to knowledge worker, you've got people that have been trying to use those devices with software, but I don't. I don't think those solutions have been have been compelling. So I, I think that's the one we're really trying to uh, to unlock. It takes a new level of, of ease of use to do it and and performance. All right. So just um, so we're going to wrap up, but just a couple of last important questions. Are you guys hiring? We would love to hear from people who um, who are interested in what we're doing. We will absolutely be hiring. Okay. I think we uh, we have we have an email address. It's probably not even live on on the site yet. I think it's uh, I think it's careers at um, campfire3d.com. And is and what's just going on? Just you you guys are still in the bay. Yeah, you're not in the old office anymore. Um, For headquarters. I mean, I know no one's office. in the office, but I mean, I think you guys were. Right. I can't. I, I was at the. I can't remember exactly what city it was. But if you're referring far. to the Meta office, I, yeah. I don't. I don't actually know. I've ne- I've never been there. Ah, okay. Um, but you're in the Bay, this, though. This is yeah. There's a we've got a warehouse space in um, in San Mateo. I'm I'm actually in uh, in San Diego. So um, until until COVID, I was doing the uh, weekly commute to the Bay Area. Okay. And then last question: uh, money VC. Are you guys yeah. raising or are you kind of like just going forward with uh, what's at hand? Like what's what's uh, the, the outlook yeah. on that end? Yeah. So we um, we're, we're engaged in a number of discussions on that front. Clearly, clearly uh, it takes money to get all this stuff done. We wanted to be pretty forward that that we had done done all of this with uh, with a pretty modest raise. Um, I think that's testament to focus. Gotcha. Gotcha. Focus, focus, focus. All right. Yes. Well, Jay Wright, CEO of Campfire. Uh, I appreciate the time. Is there any uh, last message or anything we didn't get to that you wanted to add before we sign off? No, I think that covers it. Thanks so much for the opportunity. I appreciate the uh, ability to do this and, and do my first Twitter spaces thing. <laughs> kind of yeah. fun. Hopefully it was painless. We, yeah, I've had glitches before, but this one was pretty much glitch free. So I'm happy. Um, this is Adario Strange, the editor of NextReality.net. Please vid- visit us for AR uh, news and analysis. And um, we'll uh, have this audio posted in the next couple of days. So if you missed it or if you came late, you'll be able to hear the whole thing uh, via our website. So thanks, everyone, for attending. And Jay, thanks again. Thanks, Adario. Appreciate Cheers. it.